Welcome to A Healthy Curiosity, the podcast that explores what it takes to be well in a busy world. With self-care strategies from Chinese medicine, functional medicine, Ayurveda, neuroscience, and beyond. I'm your host, Brody Welch, a licensed acupuncturist and transformation catalyst, here to support you on your journey of health, happiness, and personal evolution. Welcome to today's show. I'm your host, Brody Welch, and today we're going to be continuing our investigation of ways that we can use our bodies to affect our minds and ways that we can change the way our energy is flowing with self-care practices that come from the world of Qigong. Qigong, as many listeners probably already know, is one of the branches of Chinese medicine, energy exercise that where we are blending our intention, our breath, and the shape of our bodies in order to skillfully change the way our energy is flowing and really get in touch with our energy anatomy. We've done interviews in the past uh, with other teachers like Lee Holden. If you want to go back into the catalog of Healthy Curiosity's past episodes, you can find that one for more on Qigong. But every practitioner brings a little something different to the table. And I've recently been really impressed with the work of our guest today, Fabrice Pichet. Fabrice Pichet discovered Qigong in Chinese medicine in 1997 at the National Institute of Chinese Medicine in Montreal, Canada. In 2009, he began specializing in medical Qigong with the International Institute of Medical Qigong in Palm Desert, California. In 2011, he had the privilege of studying with Professor Lin Hoshang, director of the Shanghai Qigong Research Institute and the creator of the Taiji Qigong Shibashi system. A pioneer in teaching Qigong online, specializing in medical Qigong and its use in Chinese medicine therapy, Fabrice is passionate about linking cutting-edge science and ancient healing arts, and I am super excited that he's here to talk with me today. Fabrice, welcome to Healthy Curiosity. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. Very happy as well. <laughs> I'm really excited. I, I What I love about the work that you're doing, which is totally in line with what I hope to do in the world, is, is to make these, these principles that can be kind of esoteric and out there really accessible to people in a way that seems grounded and down to earth and where there are noticeable results that we can use in our everyday lives. Because so much of it, like there's there can be this wall of theory and all sorts of traditions that require a degree of, of specificity that seems completely divorced from their effects. And, and so what I appreciate about the classes that I've taken with you and, and what you bring to the table is that you keep it really down to earth and grounded. And I, I really appreciate that. So I'm hoping that people get a lot out of this conversation. Uh, but before we dive into Qigong, I'm curious about your personal story. Like what got you to be doing what you're doing now? It's a bit of a, a I guess a, a lucky stumble, I could say. When I was, uh, I guess, 16, 17, after high school, I didn't really know what to do. I didn't want to go to college. I was punk, anarchist. I ended up living in street for a while. And my parents, actually, my mom found the information about the Chinese medicine school. And so I went on and, and looked into it and it sounded interesting. And I went to try just the first class to see if I liked it. And I, I really fell in love with Chinese medicine in general. Uh, I was very lucky to have a, a great teacher who is still one of my teacher. I haven't really been in touch with him for a while since I'm not in Montreal anymore. But it, it kind of brought me into the knowledge of Chinese medicine and Qigong was a strong part of that school at the time. When I finished, I was, in, I was in my early 20s. I didn't feel very comfortable working in Chinese medicine specifically. So I ended up doing more martial arts and security training and, and other stuff to bring in some of those skills in real life. But I always had in mind that probably around my 30s, I would go back into Chinese medicine, which is what I did when I discovered the International Institute of Medical Qigong. I studied with Bernard Shannon over there in Palm Desert and did that for about three years before I had the, the huge privilege of meeting Professor Lin Hosheng, who's, the, as you said, the former director of the Shanghai Qigong Research Institute. 
And meeting Professor Lin really brought me a, a much deeper level of understanding of Qigong and a lot of this concept of simplifying everything. Go back to the root, go back to how the body works, because that's ultimately what we're looking for to improve the way our body is functioning through the practice of breathing, exercise, and meditation. And ideally, if we put all of those three together, then we get Qigong instead of spending an hour with each separately. Can you describe the the difference between medical Qigong and Qigong in general? Like, do you make a distinction? Mm-hmm. Yes. So I would say first understanding that the word Qigong is a very wide umbrella term that was only coined really in the 1950s in China. Before that, China is a big country. There's a lot of region that have their own type of exercise. And because they developed in different places, they all had their own way of naming things. Uh, Neigong for internal work, Dao Yin for more of a, a physical approach, Tu Na, which is more the breathing aspect. So there, there's a lot of practices that develop differently in different parts. That's why there's such a wide variety of Qigong system. And so they brought everything under the name Qigong, which if we translate it, Gong is developing a skill over a certain period of time. And qi is that source of energy, which we can probably better translate as gasotransmitters in modern Western medicine terminology. And so we develop the skills of controlling our body through the gasotransmitter system. So this is the, the general term of Qigong. Right. Um, I always love I made- that. Uh, sorry, just to interrupt, like the, that idea of like different different mountains throughout China where people are for hundreds and thousands of years practicing a particular, like, as you put it, some, you know, some people are focusing on, on how energy is moving internally. Other people are focusing more on breathing. Other people are coordinating the breath with the movement. And it's like, it, it is, it's, it's uh, what they have in common. There is a sort of the, this kernel of tuning into the subtle, what's going on in our bodies as, and specifically, what would you say like the, the commonality there is, is really working with the breath it, with, with that focus. And that's where the gasotransmitters come in. Yes. Okay. The breathing and, is definitely a, a deep part of it. Yeah. That's sort of what, what I think of is like the difference between stretching and Qigong is simply intention and breath, right? You could be doing the same thing, but what makes it Qigong is, is your focus and, and the coordination as opposed to just, just moving in a particular way. So, and you mentioned like, for those who might not be familiar with the term gasotransmitters, what do you mean by that? And then we, and then we can go into the distinction of what medical Qigong is, let you finish Mm -hmm. that question. (laughs) So gasotransmitters have been officially known only for the past 20 plus years in Western medicine. They're basically a form of neurotransmitter that circulate in gas form within the body. And for those of you who are familiar with the character of qi, it's actually a character that represents gas. So basically, we have these gases that flow in our body that are part of the nervous system, that are neurotransmitter. And the advantage of them being in gas form is that they can actually travel through the different layers of the body without the need of the nervous system. Instead of having a nerve that goes through that transmit more of an electrical signal, the gasotransmitter take the information from the nerve and then can spread it through the different layers of skin, muscle, even bones, and send out this information in a much broader way. A little bit like, you know, you, you got the fiber optic that goes into your router, and then you can connect your, your computer to the router with a, a cable, or you can use the Wi-Fi, which gives you a, a bigger range. So just to kind of get an image of how the gasotransmitters function. It seems to me that that it, this is this is a really good, like the, the way that the way that hormones work in the body or the way that blood can perfuse through tissues. It's like there, there doesn't necessarily need to be a particular pathway for these things to, to, to work on there. There is, we can identify things like nitric oxide and hydrogen sulfide and carbon monoxide. And like there's scientific research that goes into what each of these are doing in the body mm-hmm. and that are specific to particular organs. 
And it just seems like the, the, the skeptics who, who are trying to dismiss Qigong and Chinese medicine as like, oh, well, but, but what, you know, you cut open a, a cadaver and where's the, where's the, where's the liver channel? <laughs> like as though mm-hmm. that's proof that it doesn't exist or that the, that these channels are fictions. And it seems like this, this idea of gastrotransmitter therapy, it's like, there doesn't actually need to be a physical pathway. It's just mm-hmm. it, that these gases have the ability to transcend the particular structures. Mm-hmm. And there is actually a structure, except that it's an empty structure. So it's difficult to see, especially in a dead body. And what I mean by that, if you usually the Chinese don't refer to them so much as channel, but they have a, a, an image more of the bed of a river. And the points, the acupuncture points are a little bit more like the lake along the river. So if you take a, a the dry bed of a river in summer or in a dry season, you just see a dip in the ground. And if you don't know that during the rainy season, there's actually a river passing there, you might just think that it's a dip and there's nothing. But when you see it, then when it's full, and because you know the, the gasotransmitters are relatively short-lived, and they're even today, they're still very difficult to be able to measure and observe within the body in a very specific way, at least on a global level compared to you know blood vessels that are very easy to see even in a dead body. But when the body is alive, those gasotransmitters kind of flow, and that's why the channel, and, and as an acupuncturist, you're very familiar with that, that we have a general line of the channel, but you have to find it in each person because they change according to the shape of the muscle, according to how the fascia works. The same way we understand better and better the fascia by watching them in vivo when the person is alive because of all the fluids and it gives it more of a spongy structure versus uh, the, the dead body, which is drained of fluid. And it just looks like that little bit of a silk uh, aspect when it's actually more of a sponge that fills up. So observing in the living gives us a very different understanding than observing in a cadaver. Yes. And that's why some of these details were missed for so long because we didn't have tools to be able to observe in vivo. I love that science is catching up. It's so excellent. Okay, so so now finally the difference between Qigong, mm-hmm. just a person moving their own energy, <laughs> moving their own gastrotransmitters around <laughs> versus mm-hmm. medical Qigong. So Qigong in general is, as I said, an umbrella term, and it's what people can do and practice on their own. They usually have a, a general form that gives us a, a global practice. Medical Qigong is understanding how the each individual movement can affect the different system of the body, how to, for example, as a, as a therapist, teach a patient the type of movement they need to strengthen the energy system or, or the system in their body that is weakened. And then there's the side where the therapist can really build their own system so that they can influence their patient without necessarily needing to use needle or herbs or, or moxa or anything to move these gasotransmitters in somebody else, but learn how to do that with their own body, with or without contact. So massage therapy can be considered a form of medical Qigong if you add the movement of Qi in it. Got it. So much like anything, there, there's an intention piece there. And it's something that, mm-hmm. that can be applied in a, in a clinical setting, in a hands-on setting, or also taught to the patient so that they can use it on themselves. Mm -hmm. Exactly. The same way you would give a herbal formula for a patient for a certain period of time, you can give them one or two specific Qigong exercise so that they help their body to regulate a certain system. And then once they're done, it's better to go back to a more global harmonizing practice. I love giving people Qigong homework assignments or self-care assignments mm-hmm. because it is so empowering for people to be able to to have something that they can do in their daily lives that is an extension of what I'm doing with the acupuncture or with the herbs. And it's a way that that a person feels a more part of their own healing process and where they're really taking responsibility for it because they're putting their own energy and effort and intention into steering the ship in the right direction, in the direction of health and balance. And so it's a, and plus it's just fast and effective. Mm -hmm. And at the same time, 
there's a seeming paradox, I think, in the sense that there's certain things where like, it, obviously in, in Western culture, for most of us, people are too sedentary, who d- don't move enough. And that mm-hmm. simply getting up and moving, taking the body through its range of motion, do, doing um, opening channels and pathways and breathing is going to be like gentle exercise and moving meditation, which is something pretty much everyone can benefit from. Yet, so mm-hmm. so in, on the one hand, it's like Qigong can benefit everyone. And there's plenty of studies that show how it improves quality of life, especially in all well, the study that I'm familiar with is uh, done on, on seniors, on older adults. And there's all these things that are kind of of universal benefit, but it can also be quite specific and, and definitely not one size fits all. Can you maybe give us some examples of some practices that that would be right for someone and wrong for others or um, versus and like why it can be that some things are just great for everyone? Mm-hmm. So in Chinese medicine, we have this concept that's at the core of the diagnostic process, which is excess and deficiency. We want to know, is there too much of something or is there too little of something? And just like if you're you're walking on a tight rope, if you're leaning a little bit too much to the right and you adjust your body to go further right, then you're going to fall a lot faster. So you have to kind of steer to the left in order to find that balance again. And that's kind of the notion of excess or deficiency. If you have, for some reason, uh, a certain area in your body, and we'll we'll take dampness because it's a little bit easier for people to, to understand. If you have too much fluids in an area of your body that doesn't flow, that for some reason, the river is blocked and you just try to bring more strength to that river if the blockage is strong you're just going to make the river overflow and make the inundation even stronger right you the get like a spill over a flood effect exactly and just to exactly. be, to put that in context for people um some examples of of dampness pooling in a particular area or collecting and, and becoming stagnant we could have um, dampness in what we call the, the middle burner, the spleen and stomach, and you know there, that might be that might show up as gas and bloating or loose stool. We could have dampness in the bladder, which could show up, you know, be combined with heat and be you know, kind of a chronic inflammation or urinary tract infection. There could be mm-hmm. dampness that is that obstructs the reproductive organs. We could get something like ovarian cysts, um, endometriosis, like, things like that that are basically mm-hmm. uh, turbidity uh, that liquid and fluid that the body can't really make use of, and that it is in fact blocking the functionality of a particular system in the body and dampness does it tend to tend to sink and it tends to be mm-hmm. hard to get rid of lingering and and stubborn unless it's addressed and so that but the way to address it is not necessarily like make the system stronger because then then sometimes you we can we can actually make the problem worse if we try to tonify mm-hmm. as opposed to clear yeah exactly you know one one simple way to look at it is edema especially, you know, swollen feet. Let's make it even simpler. Fluid goes down, they can't really go back up. If they gather there, the, you know, and they start to to pool and don't really circulate, there's a lot of toxins that the body is supposed to exit. We're, we have about a quarter of our sweat glands in our feet. So the feet are meant to sweat, but if for some reason that function doesn't work, you want to open up so that the excessive fluid can go out as easily as possible rather than flowing all of that back up with all the, you know, just like a swamp, you don't really want to bring the swamp all the way up the legs back into the kidney to piss them later. So you can get them out directly where it's at. It's much more efficient. You know, so, so how does, the how body does that with... work? <laughs> Sorry, as people, <laughs> as I'm imagining people like turning on a little faucet in their feet, like what, <laughs> what do you, what do you mean yeah, by what you just much. said? Yeah. Uh-huh. <laughs> so <laughs> through, through the certain movement, you can help the opening of the pores so that the, the excess of fluids that are there can be uh, released. In acupuncture, you can use certain local acupuncture points with needle to stimulate that. Massage can be a very great way to get the tissue that are overflowing to kind of massage, warm up the feet so that the pores open up and then have a good sweating session. Uh, foot soak can be a good option in certain case with the proper herbs. So there's a lot of solution for it. The idea is just to find a way to get that process to happen. 
Great. So, so I appreciate that example of of here's here's a situation where where strengthening a particular area may be maybe the wrong medicine for someone. Are there practices mm-hmm. that you feel like are universally beneficial or across the board that, like generally speaking, most people can do without without harm? Mm-hmm. I would say most qigong system up to certain level can be done this way. Uh, especially the more common ones. So the, since the, the two, year 2000, there's the Qigong Health Association that's been promoted by the Chinese government where the exercises are usually very, are a bit more sport oriented. So they're keep fit, feel better, move things around and, and they'll have a bit more of a, as you were saying, a, a gentle physical exercise. Um, there's always small details that you want to be careful of, you know, alignment of the joint and things like that. That's why having a teacher is always a good thing versus only, you know, watching video online that might not have all the details that you want to go through to understand. But anything that is not forced, that is done with a little bit of awareness, soft breathing, and with mostly a releasing of tension or relaxation in mind should be uh, good for most people. The main issue, because there's also some potential issue, uh, you're probably familiar with what they call Qigong sickness or um, Qi deviation, usually comes from people overusing their mind to try to move the Qi intensely within their body and the Qi gets stuck in the head and things like that. So don't force anything. If you do it softly, there's usually not too much issue. And then gradually, as you become more efficient in your practice, then you can go with deeper understanding. To quote from one of the first articles I ever shared with the Huffington Post, Qigong is like yoga's less popular, less sexy cousin. It's a body-mind exercise or moving meditation that you deepen into with every flowing movement. I created a class rooted in one of the oldest traditional Qigong forms that you can do in 20 minutes a day, anywhere, anytime, with no stretchy pants required. I call it 12 Treasures Qigong, and it's like a moving multivitamin for every system of your body. You get a downloadable video so you can practice with me in my backyard, or you can listen to the audio track along with a cheat sheet of PDFs to help you really get into your body. To thank you for being an amazing podcast listener, use the code FRIENDOFTHEPOD for 20% off at checkout. A lifelong practice for less than what you'd spend on just one acupuncture treatment or massage. Head to the classes and meditations page at brodywelch.com today and use FRIENDOFTHEPOD for a discount at checkout. I appreciate you you mentioning that like most practices out there where people are are being gentle and and following some kind of a routine where they're breathing and moving is like they're not going to hurt themselves with that. It's a, mm-hmm. and and that's something that you know I have a I have an online qigong class that is that I'm not involved with. It's a learn from anywhere of course that that hundreds of people have taken and it's I consider it a do no harm thing. I think consider it mm-hmm. something that that most people are going to benefit from. And yeah, there absolutely is no substitute for working one on one with someone. Um and so I figured like, but when I was thinking about like what's the one thing I could do that would help the most people with their health mm-hmm. at the lowest possible cost, that was what I came yeah. up with is like teach them Qigong, right? Like then they have this self-healing tool that they can use in a medicinal way every day. Mm-hmm. And at, you were just mentioning something I wanted to circle back to, and that is alignment. Mm-hmm. I, I watched your webinar or your, your class on breathing tensegrity and that mm-hmm. really you focused a lot on the anatomy of breathing. I'd love for you to share or just enlighten people out there who maybe already have a yoga practice or already are familiar with various breathing practices. I think we talk about breathing, like almost every guest talks about breathing in some way as a, as a way <laughs> of helping us to shift out of fight or flight and back into rest and digest, rest and repair mode, moving, uh, which which is what most people spend way too much time stressed and in this sort of sympathetic activated state. So we all know, uh, or most of us who who are who have followed this podcast for a while know the importance of breathing and specifically breathing down low into the belly and how this can help us ground and center and everything like that. I'd love for you to to get to take it like give us breathing anatomy 2.0 like what what do people need to know about how we should be breathing most of the time that might be might be a new awareness for for even mm-hmm. people who already breathe 
Sure. Um, so first thing is we usually think about breathing as purely the gas exchange, taking in the oxygen, filling up the lungs, exhaling CO2. And I would, through, through this, I would add a little piece that breathing is not actually a nourishing practice. It's a garbage man practice in the sense that the oxygen come in, takes away or create the process, takes away the excess carbon, and then we exhale it. And that really makes sense when you understand it from a Chinese medicine perspective as to why the lungs are associated with the large intestine. So it's much more a process of removing than really taking in. Yeah, and that's even that's even true in, for with our with our associations that actually the lungs that the lungs are about letting go just as the their partner the large intestine is about letting go, whereas it's actually the kidneys that grasp the chi and pull it down into the body to root it. So it, it's it, yes. it very much is this this um yeah I love that sort of breathing as the cleanup crew. Mm -hmm, exactly. So we see usually this on the gas aspect. What we often don't see is how much fluid metabolism is associated with breathing. And that comes from the interplay of increased pressure and vacuum that the process of breathing creates. So the first step, most people think about starting to learn to relearn to breathe because we usually know how to breathe when we're kids and then we tense up in life and then we forget how to breathe <laughs> because of tension. Releasing tension and going back into abdominal breathing or, or using the diaphragm to really have a lower abdominal breathing starts to create a huge interplay between intra-abdominal pressure and vacuum in the chest. And this interplay with the diaphragm going down and pressurizing the abdomen kind of squeeze everything and at the same time creates more space above. So there's that vacuum that is essential for inhaling because it's not the air that forces itself into our lungs. It's because we create more space around the lungs that there's that vacuum and the air come in. That's also something that we don't usually think about. But by doing so, we also increase the return of the blood towards the heart and the rising of the fluid from the abdomen up into the lung. And the lung is one of the organ that regulates dampness within the body or fluids metabolism within the body through the bread, but also through its control of the skin. So we have this changes in pressure that the diaphragm does. And then once we're comfortable with abdominal breathing, then we have the thoracic breathing that helps to increase even more this vacuum around the lung so we can pull even more blood fluid up and pull more air inside. And then if we want to go further, we also have the cranial movement that connects with the cranial sacral rhythm uh, and that move the cerebral spinal fluid back up around the brain and then back down on the exhale. And all of this really comes from that interplay of vacuum and extra pressure that the physiological movement of breathing creates. I feel like even just knowing about that helps us tune into it. Exactly. It, it just all of a sudden is like, oh, yeah, that's how things work. <laughs> it, it's our body knows it. We're just it, it's just on an unconscious level most of the time. And so once we hear it, it's like, oh, yeah, that just physiologically makes sense. And it, it starts to change our perception of that whole process, which is what's really all what Qigong is all about is changing our metabolism so that it functions better and becoming aware of it helps us to go in the right direction. A simple exercise that we can do is to start to feel how our abdominal breathing not only pushes the front of the abdomen, but actually start to fill up the whole space. So the front to, down to the perineum and the back. And one simple way to do this, ideally, I guess, on a seated position. And so if you're driving, don't let go of the wheel. You kind of need to control that. So wait till you're back home to do this. But if you're seated in a place where you can do it, bringing your palm uh, facing out in front of you and opening your thumb, and then putting the opening between your thumb and your index finger on your waist, that soft space between the um, iliac crest and the ribs so that your index finger is about at the height of your belly button. And you can spread your other finger towards the pinky all the way down 
as close as you can towards uh, the pubic bone. And then you have the, what we call the tiger mouth, the space between the index and the thumb between uh, your hand, pushing a little bit on the side of your body. And then the thumb is just a little bit towards your back. And this way you can kind of grab your own waist and see how deep your abdominal breathing is. So taking a few breaths from that posture and observe if you can feel from the belly button down your lower abdomen kind of filling up as you breathe. I like that. And as you breathe there, see if you can also feel the pressure a little bit either to the side or towards the back, pushing also against your thumb, or if you feel only towards the front. Yeah. People forget that we're cylinders <laughs> or we're so mm -hmm. front oriented that bringing our awareness to the back of the body, imagining what we, even what we look like in space mm -hmm. and being able to feel into the parts that we don't necessarily have as well mapped. Mm -hmm. really important practice. Yeah. And, and for breathing that, image of the cylinder is essential as well. For the diaphragm to be able to stretch or, or to contract and push as low as it can, we need to have a bit of a cylinder shape. If we have too much tension in the lumbar and we're kind of pushing our belly forward, there's no room for the organs to move. They're all compressed. Therefore, the diaphragm can't really move that bubble of organs. And if we're on the opposite, just compressing the front of her body and rounding the lumbar too much, then again, everything is compressed and there's no room. So if we balance ourselves properly on the sit bone, balancing the pelvis so that we have uh, it sit like a bowl sitting straight on a table, then when the diaphragm pushes down, our organs can move up and down inside the abdomen. So what kind of an effect does this have or could this have on our health? I'd, I'd love, I, I'm sure there are people out there who are like, okay, well, this is all really interesting, but like, why mm -hmm. should I bother? <laughs> why should I bother learning <laughs> and doing this stuff? So my teacher, Professor Lin, was the director of the Shanghai Qigong Research Institute. And the in the 80s and 90s, they did a lot of research on different type of Qigong uh, exercise. The Shanghai Qigong Research Institute is part of the Shanghai University of Chinese Medicine. So it's all part of that research and they we're practicing and using the Qigong exercise on people in the hospitals associated with the university as well. So they could see how efficient it was. And one of the main effects of breathing is actually the compression and, and massage that it gives to all the different digestive organs that improve digestion in general. So through practicing the breath, of course, we have the effect on increasing the inhale volume of the lungs. We have the massage that it gives on, for example, the stomach, which helps with the peristaltism action, both for the stomach and the uh, intestine, which because the diaphragm push and release increase the movement and the organs themselves has less work to do specifically. So they get the support from it. The kidney in themselves that are sitting in the back just below the diaphragm will move up and down about, what is it, three to four centimeter each breath. Therefore, they travel kind of what, about a mile a day? What is it, half a kilometer? <laughs> no, it's two kilometer for a mile. So it's about a quarter of a mile per day in your lower back if you breathe properly. So this movement will massage the kidney, will kind of squeeze them so that the fluids that are inside can be pushed out more easily. And then when that release, the kidney open up a little bit like a sponge that you squeeze, but it's still in the water. So it pulls in more blood and therefore its function becomes a lot easier because the kidney itself don't have muscle to contract and release. It's usually more or less like a, a gravity filter. But if we have that extra pressure coming from the diaphragm from abdominal breathing, then the kidney can actually filter more blood quicker with less effort. So cool. I love, I love hearing about this, like literally not even just in this sort of like etheric kind of hypothetical way of working on these different organ systems. It, we are quite literally 
exercising these organs and ma- yes. making and and it moving what we would call chi and blood but yeah like moving fluids moving actual things through <laughs> through the organs mm-hmm. and that's um that is certainly going to benefit um benefit health i'd i'd love to know if there are are any cool stories you could share about clients you've worked with who really saw a big change in their health as a result of their practice? Mm -hmm. Yes. uh, There's quite a lot. Let me, let me think about two, which were students in uh, the, the teacher training. The first teacher training program was teaching in Montreal. One of them was a good friend of mine. Uh, He was in his mm, early sixties. He's been a very physical guy all of his life, he's been doing, you know, martial arts. So, so very physical. He was working still in his sixties, shoveling snow in the winter, doing gardening in the summer. But because of all the work that he did, his body was very stiff. So, you know, he, he could barely lift his arm above the shoulder without bringing the shoulder up to the ears. And so, you know, good health, but very tense through his body. And by learning the form and practicing and doing that every day, you could see the tension melt from one week to the next and how it fully transformed his body. He was becoming a lot more soft. His his mental state was also transforming, was feeling a lot freer in his life. Um, When when we have tension in our body and, and because of the amount of inflammation that tension creates, our mind becomes inflamed it's a lot easier to be irritated by small things because our body is already irritated. But when we start to release the tension, then the fluid circulates better. That physiological irritation kind of goes away. We let go of that inflammation and then the whole body becomes a lot softer. And he became a whole different person within the span of about a year to two years. And I'm, I'm bringing this one because it's a, a very extreme case it was very interesting to see the transformation and, and the changes of how he felt in his own, his own body. Uh, another one of our students there, she had a, a bad knee. She had a knee surgery. The doctor thought that she would probably just slowly degrade and not be able to walk as she gets closer to her 60s. When actually after three years, she was able to do not quite full squad, but able to go down more and more and went on on a hiking trip where she was walking faster and better than 25 year olds in the group. I love so it. The, the <laughs> general transformation that it did. And, and that comes with what we were saying earlier about alignment, making sure that the knee is properly aligned, that the weight is not too strong in any given part and kind of stretching how the weight is spread through the legs and through the muscle so that the tensegrity through the body becomes a lot easier. What do you mean by tensegrity for people who might not know that word? Yes. So tensegrity is a concept uh, in architecture where you can have a structure that hold itself just through the way we spread tension within the structure. You might have seen that Buckminster Fuller is, is well known for his work with this. Uh, there's another gentleman, I forget his name, who was an artist who did a lot of nice uh, structure. And, and one I've seen recently, for example, is a table where the table is made out of two parts. You have the bottom part and the top part, and none of the hard part of the table are touching. You basically have two triangles that intersect in the middle without having a physical contact, but everything else is held through uh, a tension rope that connects all the pieces together and and it gives that floatiness look through it. So the body is a little bit more complex than that because we have adjusting tension through the tendon ligaments and the muscles that can play with it, which allows us to have the whole range of motion that the body does. So we can have this structure in the body whereby adjusting the small tonicity of the muscle through the tendons and how the different joints are connected together in this way where we have a floatiness in our body. I'm not, not sure if I explained that well or if that's well, a little confusing. No, I, well, it, in regardless of how people are receiving that, it just it's that to me where I go with it is that that 
we we brought in our concept of thinking instead of thinking of the body as a collection of parts like a very mechanistic view of like oh well th- there's a problem with the knee therefore she might need it, or like she's already had a knee surgery but oh well that didn't work so she's just going to lose her ability to walk that that from the Qigong perspective or from the Chinese medicine perspective, we change the tension that's affecting the knee. We change the way that that the muscles, the tendons, what's affecting the joints and the way that the way that this person is using her body such that the joint is no longer the, this sort of bottleneck or the recipient of the same tension, the same way that it might be impacting the ground with every step because you're looking bigger and you're and you're shifting the the tensegrity, you're shifting the relationship in the the greater whole, and therefore the knee gets better. Is that yes? Does that fit exactly? Okay. Yeah. So so um, this idea that that everything is interconnected, and as we think about getting you know, I'm going to use air quotes here that energy to flow, what we're talking about is, is really, it's really about changing function. And your earlier example with the guy with the back pain, whose personality really softened as, as his body softened, as he became more flexible, he, he underwent this, this personality transformation. I think a lot of people can really relate to that. Like when we are in pain, we are edgier. We are less patient. We are, it, it takes a certain amount. I, I can relate being, you know, if I had chronic pain that was undiagnosed for, for most of my life. And, and the idea that what people can't see is that a good chunk of, of my available energy at any moment is going towards that and therefore not available to, to, to being present. And that, and that it's, uh, it's uncomfortable and it make, it makes us less, less likely to, to be, soft and gentle with our with our attitude and our demeanor and how we face the world and that that really this like the in chinese medicine there's there's this axiom right where there is where there is pain there is no free flow and where there is no free flow there is no pain and that ex- certainly exists we think about pain as a result of stagnation of energy whether that's emotional energy whether that's mental energy whether that is a a noxious stimulus that is uh, where our, our nerves are constantly pinging the brain of like hey i'm in trouble here even when there is no tissue damage or even when there is no threat as what happens a lot of times with chronic pain that's left unaddressed is that we do become we become tighter and more rigid in in the way that we interact with people and that really this can be this can be healing i, I love that example as a, a way that that we can not just downshift our nervous systems you know as a one and done okay great i'm not panicking anymore i can breathe but just in general like i'm going to show up differently in the world as a result of this practice mm-hmm. yeah exactly you know to me the the practice of qigong is developing the ability to be fully human, developing our maximum potential. And that's regardless of where you are right now. And that's also part of where the line between, I would say, regular Qigong practice versus medical Qigong practice also kind of appear when you use medical Qigong for a therapeutic perspective is that you want to bring people back into a healthy state from a disease state. But then once they're in the healthy state, they can continue and improve. And then you can even go into peak performance development if you want to go even further using that. So you can use that same tool and adapt it to where the person is to bring them where they want to go. I love it. I love it. That idea of being being fully human, being who we were born to be. Mm-hmm. And uh, and for me, like that, there's something really empowering about just being in my body and being comfortable and getting to know myself by but with this practice that, that couples that, that inward focus with the breathing, with the moving. If people are inspired to learn more about your work or to connect with you, Fabrice, where would you suggest that they go? They can... Visit through my website, um, qigong18.com. So that's Q-I-G-O-N-G and the number 18.com. They can find my YouTube channel as well, uh, youtube.com slash qigong18. Uh, I have a bunch of free videos out there if they want to get an idea of what I do. I do a lot of one-on-one training as well. So that's probably for those who really want to go deeper or want to get personalized training and help in this way. So Qigong is great for telemedicine. If people want 
support and, and wants to really take back their health with their own practice to know to have someone who can guide them into finding the best exercise for them at the moment and then have a global practice uh one-on-one -on -one online especially you know this year has been a little crazy with everybody being isolated um, but through technology nowadays we can feel as connected as if we are uh in person Wonderful. So I'll make sure that, well. yeah, I'll make sure that that link gets into the show notes and um, mm -hmm. wherever people thank are you. finding their podcasts. And Fabrice, thank you so much for joining me today and just diving into to Qigong and how powerful it can be. I really appreciate your time and your expertise. Oh, thank you very much for inviting me. It's a pleasure to be chatting with you. Thanks for listening today. To check out the show notes, get on my email list or drop me a line head to brodywelch.com. That's Brody with an IE and Welch with a CH. I'd love to hear from you. If you learn something new or feel inspired to try something different in your life, I'd love for you to pay it forward by sharing this episode with a friend who you think could also benefit and give them a reason to listen. You'll be helping to create a world where we encourage each other to embody self-respect. Till next time, be good to yourself.